Welcome to Hope for Today with Clint Decker, sharing good news through the current events and trends of our day. The universal desire of most people is to increase their income and stuff. That could mean a higher wage, buying more land, or upgrading to a newer TV. Whatever we have can be here today and gone tomorrow. Today, Clint Decker shares about money and its risks, helping us to understand the risk of missing life's most important goal. Clint is president and evangelist with the Ministry of Great Awakenings. Since 1991, he has shared the message of hope with two million people through public speaking, the internet, radio, writing, personal counseling, and television. Here's Clint. Thanks for tuning into the program today. Money is risky. It's volatile. One moment you have a, a little or a lot, and the next moment, rich and poor alike are hopeless and penniless because they've lost it all. Between 2007 and 2009, the bear market climbed up to four, over 14,000 points in the stock market. And then over that period of time, it climbed back down to just over 6,000 points in the stock market, losing nearly 54% of its value. As a result of that, many Americans lost lots of money in the stock market, especially those who are saving for retirement. And so as a result of that, many elderly had to go back to work to replenish the losses found in their retirement. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina, a Category 5 hurricane, one of the worst in American history, slammed into the Gulf Coast. The result, $81 billion worth of damage. Um, homes, businesses, nearly 2,000 lives lost literally almost overnight. Several years ago, a Harvard University report cited that over 60% of all bankruptcies were related to illness or medical expenses. In 2011, Americans put an additional $48 billion of debt on their credit cards. That was an increase of over 400% from the previous year. Very clearly, Americans were living beyond their means and now many of them are suffering from trying to pay uh, their credit card bills with the high interest rates from the credit card companies. I want to talk with you today about money and its risks. And there are risks with money like we've just talked about. If you have built up a nest egg, if you have any amount of wealth, whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, it's no respecter uh, rare is risk with money, with natural disasters, stock market crashes, health problems, credit cards, and many other things I could list in this program. Well, the bottom line is money is volatile. It is like a vapor that poof can be here today and can be gone tomorrow. So, I want to share with you my first point and sharing with you about money and its risks is this, is that money has a seductive grip. Now, it's almost unfair. It doesn't make sense. Money brings incredible risks with it, but yet at the same time, it is so alluring. It's almost, it almost doesn't make sense, and it's like the game isn't fair that way. I want to share with you um, on the, in this program, out of the Bible, from uh, a book of the Bible called the Book of Psalms, in Psalms 49, beginning in verse 5. And this first point will come out of explaining one of, these, uh, one of these verses. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches? Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die. The fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling place to all generations, though they called lands by their own names. Man and his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. 
His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. And again, my, my first point in this program is that money has this seductive grip. And in the verses that I just read, there was one verse that spoke of how we boast of the abundance of our riches. Let me ask you a question. And to be honest with me, if you can, have you ever wanted to show something off that you've just purchased? Whether it be a vehicle, uh, a new outfit, some type of toy that you got, you wanted to show it off to somebody because you were proud of something that you've just purchased. There's that allure with money where we want to boast in the things that we purchased and the things that we have and share that boast with others. The Bible also says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, and he who loves wealth with his income. Listen to that. Um, you can earn lots of money, but never seem to be satisfied with it. You can grow your wealth incredibly, but never seem to be satisfied with the amount of wealth you have. There's always this desire for more, that seductive grip of money. How unfair that this seduction never satisfies, but it keeps drawing us in. More money, more stuff. King Solomon, he lived centuries ago. He is talked about in the Bible. God blessed him tremendously, and he rose to become the wealthiest person of his day. This is what King Solomon said about his own life in his own words as he began to build his kingdom and his own wealth empire. I built huge homes for myself and planted beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned great herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who lived in Jerusalem before me. I also collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. Hear this statement. I had everything a man could desire. I became greater than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. And with it all, I remained clear-eyed that I could evaluate all these things. Anything I wanted, I took. And this last statement, I did not restrain myself from any joy. King Solomon, like everyone else, had a desire for stuff. And he had the platform and the ability to fulfill that desire to a level that many of us will probably never live to see. We might imagine that King Solomon was living, quote, the American dream. He had everything he wanted and more. But listen to Solomon's reflective and sobering words about himself, someone who had it all. Here he says, As I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. Again, the vapor. It just doesn't seem fair, the seductive grip of it all. You go and pursue it all, and then at the end, it's, it seems to be meaningless. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth around the year 5 B.C. We read about him in God's Word, the Bible. In Jesus' own words, there was a, a very purposeful reason that Jesus came. Listen to his words. He said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Obviously, we can see in the life of King Solomon, which could be retold with somebody else's name and another generation, another place, over and over and over again in the course of human history. Jesus did not come to give us life found in stuff, found in things, found in the stock market, found in, found in vehicles and toys and houses and lands and all these things. He didn't come to give us life in those things. Jesus said he came to give us life in himself. Jesus is life. 
Real life is not found in acquiring the stuff. He came to provide something that money can't buy. He came to give himself to us. And my desire is that through this program, as we talk about money and risk, you won't risk the most important thing of all, which is your soul. But you will surrender yourself fully to Jesus and trust him before this program is out today. My second point is that money can't be trusted. In the passage that I read a little bit ago, there's a statement that says, we trust in our wealth. Now, it's easy to trust in our wealth because money does so many great things. It lures us to trust in it. Uh, money, you know, allows us to be able to put a little bit of it away so we can retire in our twilight years and one day be able to back off from going to work full time and, and if our health declines as we get older, to be able to retire. Money allows us to do that. Money allows us to have shelter and getting a home. Money allows us to be able to purchase clothes so we can be warm in the, uh, in the winter and so we can be cool in the summer. Uh, also, money allows us to be able to purchase groceries or buy seeds and plant them so we can have a garden. Money allows us to be a blessing to people and organizations, uh, to be a help to them. Money allows us to do countless and countless things. And because it can do so much, it is just so seductive. But there are things that money can't do. Money can buy a house, but not a home. Money can buy friends but it can't buy friendship. Money can buy presents, but not love. Money can buy a doctor, but not health. Money can buy solitude, but not peace. Money can buy a bed, but money can't buy you rest. Money can buy so many things, but money can't buy so many things. It's often when we face loss that we realize all the things our stuff can't do. Um, if we're facing loss, we realize that. When somebody goes through a hurricane, and when somebody goes through a tornado, when somebody is experiencing cancer, when somebody experiences some type of tragedy and they're experiencing loss, all of a sudden they come face to face and realize all this stuff that it can't do. And they realize all of a sudden what are the most important things in life. Today, Jesus says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Another way to say this is trust in God. Trust in God. Trust also in Christ. Don't trust in our things. Things and stuff will disappoint you, especially in those times when you face loss. But Jesus never will disappoint you. Money and risk, there's so much risk with it. Don't trust it. Trust Christ, but don't trust stuff. Don't, don't trust things. My third point to share with you is money can buy a mansion on earth, but not even a shack in heaven. The uh, scripture that we had read just to highlight it again, says, No man can ransom another or give God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. Money, good deeds, acts of kindness, a lot of wealth, a little bit of wealth, whatever it is, religious exercises, none of that can redeem or ransom our eternal soul to transfer us from the kingdom of hell, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light, or the kingdom of heaven. Now, if it could, what would be the magic number? If our money and our wealth and giving things to charity, putting things in the basket as it goes by at church, if, those, if that could help us get to heaven, tell me, what is the number? What is the magic number financially? How much do we have to give? How many dollars? Okay, if it is uh, religious exercises, what is the line in the sand? How many times do we have to go to church? How many times do we have to go to this place and this place before we finally arrive? 
If it is a matter of good deeds, how many good deeds? What kinds of good deeds? Does anybody have an answer? I've studied the Bible a lot. I've talked to a lot of people about religious things, and I've never come up with a number. So what do we do? We just wait till we get to the end and hope for the best. That's too much risk when we're talking about our eternal soul. There's too much in the balance. There is only one thing that is keeping us out of heaven. Only one thing, and that is sin. And our sin needs to be forgiven. Our lies, our immorality, our, all of the dark stuff in us needs to be forgiven and washed away in order for us to get in to the kingdom of heaven. And no amount of money can provide for the forgiveness of sins. Putting a tithe or an offering gift in, uh, in the plate as it's passed at church can't forgive my sin. Writing a check to a wonderful charitable cause can't forgive my sin. None of these things can forgive my sin except for one. There's only one thing on earth, and that is Jesus. He ended his life around 35 AD. He died upon a wooden cross. It was a gruesome death. It was a blood-stained cross that he died upon. Then three days later, he overcame that death and conquered sin, death, and the grave and rose again from the dead. And that blood that stained that cross, that blood and that blood alone can wash away our sin. Nothing else can except for the blood of Christ can wash away that sin. And because Jesus lives and is no longer dead, because He lives, you can live and I can live today as well. The Bible says, But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still yet sinners. Believe in Christ today with all of your heart, money and its risks. The most important thing is your soul. Don't risk your soul for the sake of pursuing tangible things of this earth. Trust in Christ to forgive all your sins and to give you a new heart today. My, my fourth point is this, is that money isn't the end goal. If you haven't already been able to pick that up through the program so far. The Bible says, For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers. When we meet life's final challenge, death, we can't take any stuff with us to the next world. We will carry nothing away. Some people have tried. We look back in time to some of the uh, Egyptian pharaohs, and you can archaeologists have gone into some of their tombs and found all this stuff, gold and all this stuff that they were buried with. But you know what? They died and that stuff is still there. It didn't go with them into the next world. You can be buried with all kinds of things in your coffin, in your tomb, wherever, and it will remain, but your soul will depart and go to the next world without all of that stuff. And in addition, all the glory that we would have accomplished in our earthly life made up of all the successes and the influence and the position and the things that we've done. All this glory will go down with us into the grave. When we cross over the threshold into eternity, we stand before God face to face without all the glory of the things we did in this earth. And on the other side, on this side of earth, we can go ahead and we can have libraries and buildings and parks and airports and all kinds of things named after people who did wonderful things on this earth. But when we cross from this, er, this place, this temporal place, into the next world, there's not going to be, we're not going to carry over any of those placards, any of those nameplates, any of those certificates. We just stand before God. Just our soul stands before Him. Just He and us. And the most important thing is the condition of our soul and what we did with Jesus while we were in this body, while we still have breath. Sometimes in the pursuit of money and stuff, our priorities can get all mixed up. One day we may wake up and we may find we've lost it all. We've lost sight of God. We've lost sight of our marriage and our kids and our family and our friends. We've lost sight even of ourselves. We may realize one day that, hey, I wasn't the person I used to be. I got caught up in all this stuff. And man, I'm a different woman. I'm a different man than I used to be. Listen to the lyrics from the song, American Dream by the music group Casting Crowns. He used to say, whoever dies with the most toys wins. But if he loses his soul, what has he gained in the end? 
I'll take a shack on the rock over a castle in the sand. Now he works all day and cries alone at night. It's not getting any better. Looks like he's running out of time. Because he worked and built with his own two hands. He poured all he had into a castle made with sand. But the wind and the rain are coming crashing in. Time will tell just how long his kingdom stands. His kingdom stands. Jesus said, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. How is it with you today? Here are two examples, polar opposites. See which one you are in these two stories. First, Jesus had an encounter one time with this young rich man who came searching before him. He wanted to follow him. Being wise, Jesus knew stuff had a hold on this young man. Jesus tested him, saying, Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. When Jesus said this, the young man became disappointed and turned and walked away. Jesus was asking too much of him. He couldn't. He wanted money and status more than he wanted Jesus. Now for the other story, this was also a young man who was very wealthy and also a very prodigy type of young man. His name was Zacchaeus, a tax collector. Rose up in the ranks, became very wealthy. He did very well, became successful. His wealth was acquired through unethical means though. He would jack up the amount of taxes a person owed and then skim some off of the top for himself and then give the rest to the government. One day, Jesus came to his hometown. He was like a celebrity, so people lined the streets. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to get above the crowd so he could see Jesus walking the streets. Jesus spotted Zacchaeus in that tree and told him to come down and that he needed to go to his house and visit with him. Together, they left the crowds and spent time alone in Zacchaeus' home. Soon they came out of the home and stood before the crowd. Jesus announced that Zacchaeus' life had been changed and that he would give four times the money back to the people whom he overcharged and that he would give half of his wealth to the poor. Which one of these two men do you think got it right? Zacchaeus. Which one of these men do you think you represent? Do you more have the heart of the young rich ruler, where your stuff has more a hold on you than Jesus? Or do you think you have the heart of Zacchaeus? Well, you're willing to give it all away for the sake of Christ, if that's what he should ask you to do. Money has risks. The greatest risk that money has of it all is clouding the important things of life, where we lose perspective of what is important. We lose perspective of God. We lose perspective of those whom we love and we lose perspective of ourself. If it is well with our soul, it will soon be well with those whom we love. So let's settle this today. Let's take the risk out of money today. Let's turn from self and turn to Christ so that money and things and stuff no longer have a grip on us that it once did. So how do we get there and we do that? First of all, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This communicates that God loves you. The reason that I'm sharing this message and that God, I believe, has given me this message to share with you is because God loves you. God sees the danger in throwing your life away and accumulating stuff, but losing your own soul, and losing your family, losing yourself. God doesn't want that to happen. So he's communicating to you out of a heart of compassion and out of a heart of love. And secondly, we must believe. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And trust all that you are to Christ. And trust everything to him. Shift it from trusting into things and to money and stuff and trust fully into Him, even though you don't understand it all. And then thirdly, repent. The Bible says that God commands all people everywhere to repent because He has fixed the day in which He will judge the world. 
while there is still time, while you still have breath in your body and life in your lungs, while you still have time, turn from your ways and turn to Christ and receive his plan for you. Receive the life that he has for you. And then lastly, forgiveness. The Bible says, and in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Christ paid for something that we could never pay for. He gave us something that we could never provide ourselves. He has given us the forgiveness of sins. And if we will only believe, and if we will only repent, oh, the love of Christ will bring us, will bring you right at this moment, the forgiveness of all your sins. No matter what you've done, no matter how dark the stain of that sin is, if you surrender all to Him at this hour, He'll take the weight and the guilt and the shame of all that sin and it'll be gone. I hope that all this that we've talked about in this program makes sense to you today. You've been listening to the message, Money and Its Risks. Throughout the program, Clint Decker was sharing how money has risks. The greatest risk is clouding the mind so that the most important things in life are pushed aside. And the most important goal of life is the salvation of your eternal soul and that of your family and friends as well. How do you do that? First, understand God's love. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Second, you must believe. The Bible says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. To believe is to trust or commit your life wholly to Christ. Thirdly, you must repent. The Bible says that God commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. To repent means to turn our mind and lives towards God or experience his judgment. And if we do, we'll be forgiven. The Bible says, in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. All this can be yours today and for the rest of your life if you will only call upon God. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In your own words, in your own way, with a spirit of humility, call upon God right now. Call upon him to change you into a new person. If God has changed you, please contact us. Let us know your comments or questions and your story. If you do not have a Bible, let us know and we will send you a free one. We would like to put a Bible study in your hands too. It's called The Pathway to Christian Maturity written by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. It's our gift to you. Contact us on the web at greatawakenings.org, through our Facebook page, or follow Clint on Twitter. We also have a YouTube page if you would like to watch again or access archive programs. You can also contact us by phone or through the mail at Great Awakenings, 107 South 7th Street, Clay Center, Kansas, 67432. Or during business hours, call 785-632-5063. On behalf of our team and the supporters that made this program possible, thanks for joining us. Tune in again next time for another edition of Hope for Today with Clint Decker.